time to go through the papers now and joining us this morning for the second time today is political editor of Sunday People, Nigel Nelson, and former Conservative advisor, Claire Pearce, or real-life married couple, so it's been fireworks here this morning, <laughs> differing political opinions, which makes for great telly, I must say. Um, Nigel, let's start with you, shall we, and the mail. Uh, this is about Keir Starmer and the trans issue. It's an issue that won't go away. For it's, it won't go away, I'm afraid, this one. Um, yes, yeah, so and this is um, the women, women's rights campaigner, Julie Bindle, who says unless Keir Starmer changes uh, tack on this uh, broadly to actually say, look, um, we want to clamp down on trans women using uh, safe spaces for other women, uh, she, won't vote, she won't vote Labour again. She can't uh, support them. She's been a lifelong Labour supporter. The, the problem here is I think that the you start from the you start from the point. Do you think it is a basic human right to be able to choose your gender? If you do, should it not be the be as easy as possible to do it? And then you've got to sort out the problems of things like safe spaces, women's changing rooms in shops, uh, women's loos, where people go. Schools are doing this all the time. That they've got uh, trans pupils, and if there is a problem with a trans pupil using, say, a girl's changing room, um, and I was hear, hearing over the weekend of just such a problem, then they create their own trans spaces. Now, it may well be we as a society have to, have to think about doing that kind of thing. Yeah, the thing that gets me about this, um, Claire, so I, I've known Judy for years, so I used to edit a men's magazine. Um, it had lots of quality articles in it um, <laughs> called Loaded, and Judy Binder was, was staunchly opposed to, to what we did, and yet now, um, common sense people agree with you. I agree with Judy on this. Mm. Because, you know, really, if Keir Starmer can't say what a woman is when asked, if he says people with cervixes, if he says chest feeding, surely this is outright misogyny. It absolutely is. Tens of millions of women just want to be referred to as a woman. They want to have that biological sex taken as something that is real and is something that is important. And I think this is the trap that Keir Starmer has unfortunately fallen into. He's given into those bullies in yeah. the trans space, which unfortunately tend to be the loudest voices, who will be the first ones out there to say, you're a transphobe because you have a different opinion. And unfortunately, Keir Starmer has not stood up for them, has not stood up to them. So millions of women, like Julie Bindle, I do agree with her on this, yeah. that they are letting down, the Labour Party are letting down those tens of millions of women who will not vote again because he cannot answer a simple question as to what is a woman. Um, do you think that 2023 might be the year of common sense? Put it to both of you on this issue because <laughs> we've seen pushback against Stonewall, Tavistock Clinic, Mermaids. It does seem that, that people are, are pushing Well, I'm not sure again. Claire was talking common sense a second ago, so um, oh, on, the, on, this, on this particular one, you, you start from the principle... Can we accept that some people um, feel uncomfortable in the biological sex they have and want to change their gender? And if they do, let's sort out the problems along the way. Not say they can't do it or a trans woman is not a woman. By allowing those people into women's spaces where they're vulnerable, you know, domestic violence centres, and that's what Judy Bindel has, 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 has campaigned on with J.K. Rowling. Yep. They, opened a, yep. they uh, opened a women's only space in Edinburgh where d d victims of domestic violence violence and sexual assault. Women are allowed to go to be away from men. That would strike me as a basic human right, and they're being called transphobic for that. Well, I mean, I don't think they are transphobic. This is my point about what we have to do along the way. It's a bit like, like um, uh, same-sex uh, relationship legislation. It took a while to actually sort out the various anomalies in the law. And so, in a situation like this, what I'm talking about is, let's get these kind of anomalies sorted out as we go along. Mm. Okay, well, let's move on to another of my favourite people now. City. Yeah. Oh. Claire, um, yeah. his latest plan in the war on motorists, it, he, it's claimed in the Telegraph today it's destroying London, but this is not just a London issue, is it? It's not just a London issue, and this is highlighted very nicely by Gareth Bacon, who is the MP for Orpington, which is Greater London. Yeah. And he is highlighting the fact that the 
Pre the Sadiq Khan's team are going to sell this as a tax on the wealthy, and this is going to improve air quality this in Central. This is being expanded, is it? This is. It's the uh, ultra-low emission zone being expanded. So it's an extra £12.50 per day charge to drive through the zone. Gareth Bacon's argument is that it doesn't affect the wealthy. This actually affects the lowest income households. 50% of outer London households who earn around about £10,000 own a car. Yeah. They tend to be older cars, but they are dependent upon them. And that increases up to 70% for those households earning 20000 So these aren't your highest earners. These are people going around their everyday lives trying to get on. And if we look at all of the problems that we've had with strikes, you cannot get a train. And I think what Sadiq Khan is failing to understand is that everywhere is not like Islington. Yeah. Nigel should also agree with this, considering that we live in quite a rural area, which doesn't have very many bus services, if any, a very poor train service, and we rely upon a car. And all we have to do is drive 10 miles towards Dartford yeah. and across that border into Greater London, and we would be charged £12.50. Yeah, Nigel, it's, it's worth picking up on, on the fact that a lot, a lot of bad ideas start in London. Um, this is taxation dressed as salvation, and it will, it will be going, it's already in Manchester, it's in Birmingham, it's been proposed in Bradford, it's been proposed in Oxford. This isn't just a London-centric thing that we should be bothered about down here. This is coming to a town near you, and it's going to hammer the poorest motorist hardest, isn't it? Yes, well, I mean, it's going to hammer every motorist. Um, the, the question comes down to whether or not we really want to try and reach net zero by 2050. And if we do, there's a lot of sacrifices have to be made along the way. Now, I appreciate there's some research by TfL for this particular scheme that it may not um, uh, help air quality that much. But the whole aim of these things is to do just that. So uh, my view is we should be going for net zero, going hell for the leather for, for, for net zero. And schemes like this, we're going to have to accept. It's going to be uncomfortable for all of but us. But what if, it makes pe if net zero makes people net poorer and net colder? I mean, that's what's happening, Claire. But it is. And I don't agree that this is anything to do with net zero and all of those very laudable aims, which I fantastically disagree with, because I do think you're right. I think it I think it does make people poorer. I think this whole push towards net zero is just very expensive, very ill thought through and isn't going to work. But I think the real crux of the issue here is it's going to do very little for air quality, but an awful lot to prop up a failing administration by taking in fines from people who can least afford it. And that seems to be what Sadiq is doing, trying to balance his own budget, taking money from motorists. Yeah. And the yeah. context, I think, of this is important because in a cost of living crisis, I mean, anecdotal Totally, I, I was getting a taxi the other day, and the taxi driver was was telling me that he couldn't afford to buy yeah. a new car next year with with everything else going up and the energy bills and his mortgage yeah. uh, and everything. And he, he's going to have to look for a new job. He cannot afford a new car uh, and to drive um, through the ULEZ zone. So it's, it's going to be difficult for people who who rely yeah. on cars uh, for work. Yeah. And it is people like who, who drive a, a white van. You yeah. know, yeah. you don't have a choice yeah. but to drive. The working class is a bit um, hardest by it. Exactly, okay. um, Nigel. Let's stick to a motoring story, shall we? and 50 drivers a day are caught still using their phones behind the wheel. I'm sure this is one we could all agree on. Yeah. Uh, this is absolutely disgraceful. Um, uh, the, the, the figures show that it's gone up 10% since uh, last year. Quite clearly, it's irresponsible and dangerous and in fact just to rub the point home that the the male um mention a two-week-old baby who was killed by a motorist oh. using using the a mobile phone yeah. an off-duty police sergeant on her uh, bicycle who was knocked off and killed again in the same way quite clearly you should not use your mobile mm. when you are driving um the penalties actually are quite high so you get 200 pound fine six points on your license, so if you do it twice, then you're off the road. Maybe we should think about a ban a bit earlier. Yeah, but mm. th there are cases if, you, if your phone is in a kind of holder and you have to tap. Things are not talking yeah, about this. You know, they're, actually, they're, yeah. they're talking about the handheld. Hold, yeah, holding yeah. your hand is when you're in trouble. You're, yes. you're okay to tap away on your on your ways. Which should be fine. Yeah. That should yeah. be fine. It's, it's in the hand. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Good. Moving on, Claire, to the story I mentioned at the top of the hour. There, the Guardian is having a moan about Brexit. Some things are constant. <sighs> They are, some things really are constant and The Guardian and Brexit are always going to be up there. And uh, this highlights charities who were reliant upon EU funding are yeah. having problems because the government hasn't rolled out the replacement scheme, which is the UK Shared Prosperity 
fund. The government hasn't rolled it out quicker. So I like to disagree with The Guardian pretty much every single time I read it. And I think this is less of a Brexit problem. This is more of a government administration yeah. problem. And all it is is the government needs to get its act together and actually put that money to the places that it needs to do that. Charities should not have to be shutting down and shedding staff because the government cannot put out a scheme which is there to do uh, exactly and, and that. And another area it mentions there is farming. It and, does, and those yeah. of us who campaigned hard for Brexit have always said that yeah. those grants that the farmers get in Britain from the EU should be replaced Absolutely. by central government in Britain. And I don't think anybody would disagree with that. And the money is there. And that's the really frustrating part of it is the money is already there and it is, it is almost allocated out into individual pots. But it just hasn't been given out. And you've got to, you've got to look at this. It's, this isn't a Brexit problem. I think that it's a very lazy headline from The Guardian. This is Maybe a government Nigel problem. Disagrees. Is it a Brexit no, problem? No, I, in fact, actually, um, Claire and myself disagree fundamentally over Brexit. She's a Brexiteer. I'm a Remainer. Yeah. Um, however, no, I do agree with Claire on this one. It's not a Brexit problem. Um, this was already allocated. This was money sorted out to actually sort out what would happen when we lost the EU regional funds. It should be paid. I think you guys are agreeing way too much on this show. <laughs> we'll, we'll go away again and have another yeah. fight. During <laughs> half time, come back on battle stations. But Ellie, there's a story that you want to cover. A, a, I a do. We've got story. one minute, and let, let's just have a little bit of, of fun with this one. And it's about uh, the Order of the Porky Blinders. Tell us about this. It's in the Star. <laughs> These are uh, villagers in Silleth near Carlisle in Cumbria, oh. and uh, the I'll villagers yeah. are living in fear of a gang of wild pigs <laughs> out yeah. on the loose. They're not sure where. Where they've come from, but they are uh, described as destructive and willful, <laughs> solid, fast, and strong. I mean, these are the <laughs> ultimate predators roaming around in a dark village, but people walking their dogs, coming across uh, some random pigs. The RSPCA have actually located where they're from and have put them back and secured oh, the fencing. Yeah. So they're they're they are wild boars, safe. aren't they? <laughs> a gang of runaway pigs. <laughs> runaway pigs. Uh, dangerous the time. Them. Dangerous time to be a porky player. <laughs> yeah. Walking pork pie, watch out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, Nigel, Claire, thank you so much. Splendid fun, cheers.